on cornerofthegalaxy.com. It's time for another episode of Corner of the Galaxy from the Box, the show that gets you behind the scenes of the LA Galaxy and into the minds of soccer reporters and MLS experts. Your hosts for the day are Corner of the Galaxy's Josh Gessman and LA Times soccer reporter Kevin Baxter. Let's start the show. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Corner of the Galaxy from the box on cornerofthegalaxy.com. I'm your host, Josh Gessman, coming to you on a Monday, April 12th. LA Galaxy, this is game week for them. They will be playing a game in Miami on Sunday, April 18th. We'll give you the details on that, plus we'll sort of tell you what to expect as we creep ever so slowly this week towards that game. A bunch of other information uh, as well. We want to go over the LA Galaxy's win over Real Salt Lake in their last preseason game. That gave us some insights into maybe what Greg Vanny is looking at. We have some Sebastian Legette news that is not great for the LA Galaxy. Uh, we're going to discuss that a little bit and see if Legette will even be with my even be with the team in Miami. So we're going to talk about that as well. And then uh, some other little news items that come in, including Kevin Cabral, when we can expect him. So a lot of stuff to get to. A busy, busy day to help me do all that. Uh, the man himself, Mr. Kevin the Panda Baxter. Kev, how's it going, buddy? You think they're going to play a game in, in Miami this weekend. We hope they're going to play a game in Miami this weekend. We really don't know, do we? No, no, we don't know. Um, I mean, we, we feel like it's headed that direction. I mean, we played this game before, though, if you'll remember last year. The LA Galaxy were supposed to head to Miami and play a game and then COVID and nothing happened and they've never actually faced them. This will be the first time they play against Miami, but all signs are currently pointing to them playing a game and it doesn't seem like it's going to be, a, you know, a, a, a last minute thing. You know, I checked into that because I remember that timeline last year when the Galaxy were getting ready to go and we all were questioning, look, is this game going to happen? Or are they going to make the road trip? And the team was still flying chartered at that time. Um, it was Friday morning the team was supposed to leave, very early Friday morning. It was Thursday morning when the league called off all the games. So the Galaxy never left for the airport, but they were within 24 hours of leaving for Miami. By the way, before we get any further, a couple of housekeeping details for people that are watching us. You do see the Montserrat jersey here, Montserrat national team. That's They're very nice. Emerald boys, as you can tell. They're undefeated in this round of World Cup qualifying, and their last game was a 1-1 draw with El Salvador. So maybe... This is the year Montserrat finally qualifies for the World Cup. Also behind me, my answer to the Kobe bear behind you. Right. Is I have my own bear. It's a panda because pandas are much better. It's my own right. galaxy bear. Uh -huh. And so that is now part of a galaxy, uh, a corner of the galaxy studios north. That, that, that's good. And and like you, um, com with compared to me, you're much smaller. Your your panda is much smaller. Um, not as good looking, obviously, as my bear, who has been who's been doing a lot of weightlifting weight lately. So so really, sort of you know, getting in shape. You can see it. You so, got a uh, carpet or something there too. A rug or, <laughs> I, what's going on so, there? So uh, I had a listener uh, who did a whole bunch of stuff, and uh, he escapes my na his name escapes me right now. Um, but actually made some galaxy flags. They're two sided galaxy flags. So they have the old LA Galaxy logo, and then they have the uh, the Quasar logo, which was, or I guess, you know, the, the black hole original logo on it as well. So that's sort of being uh, the carpet, so to speak, right now. And then, um, you know, for this particular uh, show, I'm wearing uh, some kit and bone stuff that I got, which they sort of did an LA Galaxy themed um, sort of mini collection. And I think I bought everything that they have, probably not everything, but uh, I'm wearing their Lost Angels um, shirt that they have on, which is kind of a, a cool thing. This is the number 10. I think it's appropriate because I think the LA Galaxy have been lost angels um, here for a little while. So um, I, I kind of enjoy uh, what their little spin and take on things. And they even, you know, a coffee mug as well. I would like to point out, I paid for all this stuff. They didn't, they didn't pay me. So this is not, you know, a paid sponsorship. I would have gladly taken this stuff for 
for free, Kevin, because um, you know I'm I'm pretty much for sale at any point. Um, if, if it's free, it's me. I'm the same. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, I mean, I'll sell out for just about anything. But in this particular case, um, I bought all this stuff. It's great. They even had some, uh, some coasters as well that I put into the um, – we're calling this now the COG Boudoir. Um, over here on this side. So, uh, you know, the COG boudoir is, is, is all dressed in green and gold for this particular show tonight. So I figured I'd wear my, my kit and bone jersey as well. So there you go. That's, uh, you if, know. If my, if my bear fought your bear, who would, I guess your bear would win. Yeah, my bear, bear would win. It wouldn't even be close. Long they, arms. It, it, it would be over in a matter of seconds, really. Um, it wouldn't be worth watching. So uh, let's get to a little bit of LA Galaxy now. Um, some talk here as we get closer. One of the big things that we were able to see, Kevin, um, is, and we expected it to be this way. I don't think we expected there not to be um, a lot of stuff before this. In terms of the preseason, you can look at all the preseason games that the Galaxy have played, Kevin. Uh, did you ever get their total record? By the way, I know you and I were talking about that. Yeah, I have them playing nine games, seven against MLS competition, the two with the loyal. Uh, and I have them at three, two, and four. Three, two, and four. I think that's right. I think that sounds about right. Yeah, it was right in there. We went over that included super secret scrimmages against um, Columbus and LAFC um, right. in there. And so, you know, just some and the two against San Diego Loyal, those were two 60 minute games, not two 90 minute games. Right. So. And, and they won one and, draw, and had a draw, I think it was. Yeah, they did. Um, and, now, and the LAFC game that, that sounded like it was all secret and, and you know, cloak and dagger and all that. Uh, what I found out later is that both teams knew that and neither team was hiding it. They just feared that people would, that fans would show up, stand outside the stadium. It was that Bank of California, stand outside the stadium, and perhaps, you know, chaos would ensue. So right. they just decided not to tell anybody. Yeah, I probably, mean. Probably a good decision. I, I was they weren't going to let people in anyways. Yeah, I was going to say, that's that's a smart decision. I have no problems with that. So, um, but yeah, so so we get there. But we, we thought through all those games, and you look at it. Kevin, until they got to Tucson, we really didn't have anything even close to resembling a starting lineup. And realistically, uh, the last two, two-ish games um, gave us the most insight into maybe what Greg Vanny is trying to do um, with this particular team and, and all the additions and the different things that they had um, for all these guys. So um, one of the things that we had was the starting lineup. Um, the starting lineup for this particular game included what I think are eight starters, um, but there's some there's some asterisks sort of in there as well because um, we can say and look at these and say, okay, well, maybe there's there's more than that. Maybe Greg Vanny's trying to tell us something. But anyway, we had two debuts in this. Uh, O'Neal Fisher made his LA Galaxy preseason debut you don't say that they debuted for the LA Galaxy. Say preseason debut. The real debut will come whenever actual league play starts. But they made their preseason debut. O'Neill Fisher um, and then Sam Grancier. Uh, Grancier also made you know a 25 minute I think uh, appearance for the LA Galaxy. Finally in camp. Finally got to train. Um, and so we saw a little bit of Sam there as well. So um, between Jonathan Bond starting Fisher at right back for Julian Araujo for you know a, a chunk of the first half. Uh, Dan Stairs I think is a starter. So we go Bond is a starter. Fisher, probably not a starter. Julian Araujo is a starter, but he's going to be a backup. Stares is a starter. Depew, for all of this preseason, Kevin, we have seen that Jalen Neal has been paired with Dan Stares at the center back position um, in sort of what we consider the quote-unquote starting lineup. Um, and in this particular game, it's Nick Depew, which may signal something for the Miami game uh, if we're trying to connect the dots for that. So that was interesting. Viafania started at the left back position. Sebastian Legette, I think, actually started out on the wing. Uh, Jonathan Dos Santos was in this game. Uh, he played it in, in sort of that that eight role, I would say, more than the six role in this one. Adam Saldana, who has been sort of a, I think, a, one of the guys who had the best pre seasons for the LA Galaxy. Uh, Saldana started in this more in the defensive midfielder role, but paired next to Jonathan Dos Santos. You had Grancia out on the right wing. Uh, you had Vasquez playing in the center, Victor Vasquez, and then you had Chicharito starting up top. So when you look at this, Kevin, there are a whole bunch of starters, and I think that there are some things in here that Greg Vanny is definitely going to be looking at whenever you look at Miami, but there's also some things in here that may have been as close to a starting lineup as we'll see. Um, and that may not be reflective of what we see in Miami because when you look at the time spent here, um, you know, Grand Sear played a total of 25 minutes. O'Neill Fisher played um, a total of 38 minutes. So they were, th those guys are not ready to go for a significant amount of time. And maybe Grand Sear could be pushed to a full half of 45 minutes, but I don't think he's going to be able to be pushed much past that in the last week. So <clears throat> what do you think of uh, of any of sort of the preseason as a whole um, and then a little bit with the starting lineup? 
Well, I, you know, Vasquez scored the only goal in the final game. And it was interesting because he scored it off the rebound of a Chicharito shot. So he's pushing sort of into, I know they play Chicharito as a lone striker, but Vasquez, at least in his, uh, you know, small appearances have been right behind him playing almost as a withdrawn striker. Interesting role. I didn't see him playing that. I thought he would be a little further back up field. Um, so that's interesting. He uh, Vasquez talked after the game about how he gets Fanny's style of play. He understands it, but he doesn't understand his teammates yet. And he said that that, that is going to come, that the more they play, the more they train, the more they're going to get comfortable with, with one another. And Greg Vanny talked about that uh, after the game, too. I don't know if you heard his press conference, but um, I'm looking for his quote now. He, he said, we're as ready as we're going to get. And he said, we'll take more time. We'd love to have more time, but we know that what the deadline is. We, we haven't got guys here. He said again what he said multiple times. This roster is a work in progress. Um, we're going to talk about Kevin Cabral not even going to be here. That, that guy's going to be, you know, a 90-minute guy when he gets here, not even here yet. Right. So, uh, you know, uh, I, I wouldn't say Vanny is lowering expectations because he's he's taking responsibility. He's saying we're going to play the game Sunday with the guys we have. It's just not everybody that we want. It's a work in progress. We're going to be going at this for a while. Um, but, um, it, you know, I think having said all that, I think they look pretty good. Yeah, I think that's the big takeaway, and I think it was even a surprise. RSL apparently had been playing this preseason rather well, Kevin, whenever we've been been watching, um, and the announcers who were covering most of the games, I think they did all of the Sun Cup games that were, were televised. I think they're the, the FC Tucson announcers or they're the Phoenix Rising announcers. I don't remember. They're actually... I know people were sort of giving them, you know, some stick on online and saying this different things for having to cover as many games as they did. I thought they did a perfectly fine job, um, you know, got a lot of interesting details out that obviously the diehard fans know. But if you didn't know, um, you know, they were I, I think they were correct on most of those things. So in general, um, in total, I would say that you look at that and say, OK, you know, the L.A. Galaxy. Um, we're going up against one of the better teams in that preseason, certainly in that Sun Cup area with against RSL. And they expected, the announcers expected, that RSL was really going to push the LA Galaxy around. That is not what happened at all. The LA Galaxy absolutely controlled this game for most of the time out there. I'm not going to say they didn't have some defensive breakdowns. They did. Uh, but if we're taking things on a whole, the LA Galaxy were the aggressor. They held the ball. I think Vasquez afterwards talked about, hey, we like to hold the ball. We like to play with the ball. I understand that. We're going to get better at that. Um, but they had the ball. They were the aggressors. They were the ones creating offensive chances. They were switching sides. You talked about the the goal that Vasquez scored and what a perfectly um, what what a perfect way to illustrate what I think Greg Vanny has been trying to get the LA Galaxy to do. But they switched sides. A good inlet pass from Julian Araujo. A great turn from Chicharito that ended the ball back to Sebastian Legette, who was also up on the front line with Chicharito at this point. They had worked their way back behind the defense. This is stuff that we have not seen from the Galaxy in a long time, Kevin. It used to be throw the ball to Zlatan and then everybody, you know, run around with your head cut off and don't worry about where Zlatan's going to be. He's not going to pass you the ball. And so. by the way, that's not a philosophy. That's just that's street ball. <laughs> I mean, there were lots. Listen, I think Siggy and and Guillermo both played it that way. But yeah, you're right. right. Um, they, yeah, that, that's not. Uh, that's, and we who wouldn't? I mean, uh, you know, the, the best player in the league, you give him the ball. It's not a horrible strategy. It just was better in 2018 when they had Ola Kamara there, also supporting those runs, than it would have been, you know, in in 2019, whenever it was just Laton sort of by himself. So although he scored 30 goals that year, so. I mean, it, I get, yeah, but, you know, and the Galaxy did make the playoffs that year and miss it the year before. I mean, there's yeah. lots of arguments. I, I get it. I'm just, the 2018 team was a better team than the 2019 team, but the 2019 team made it to the playoffs and won a playoff game. You, you know, hey, that's how it goes sometimes, but, right? But, but where are you going with this whole stylistic thing and what they did? I, what I find interesting is they have not scored a ton of goals. I went to Tucson. I don't think they scored more than one goal in any game. They were actually shut out once. I think Sporting Kansas City... They were shut out. You know, this Miami game, I think, and we'll talk about this in a minute, why I think this, but I think you can throw the Miami game away. I think it's almost another preseason game because of where Miami's been right. so far. I don't think we can read a lot. So whatever happens in the Miami game, I don't think that's indicative of what happened in the regular season. My point is, I think these one to nothing, two to one games, that's what we're going to see from the Galaxy all season. I think defensively, especially with Julian Bond, I think they might be pretty good. I just, you know, everyone's talking about Chicharito. I don't see him scoring a ton of – I don't see them scoring a ton of goals. I think there's going to be a lot of tight, 
uh, games that are going to go down to the final seconds. And 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 I think Julian Bond's going to. Uh, I think he's going to have a great season, I, and, and the way I see them playing, I think he's going to be the key to their success. You're, you're confusing two players, Jonathan Bond and Julian Araujo. So Jonathan Bond, not Julian Bond. So just that's... Julian Bond was a a Georgia <laughs> Congress person, though. <laughs> Which how good how good were they at uh, at at stopping? Walls? I yield my time back to Josh Gessman. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say. Um, no, I, I listen. Uh, you know, there's been some prediction things that I've sort of done and and gone about, and somebody said, you know. What you know? Who do you think is going to be the Golden Boot winner? And I said, I think it's going to be Chicharito. Um, you know, who do you think is going to be the Player of the Year? I, you know, it wouldn't surprise me if Chicharito scores is the Golden Boot winner, which I'd expect him to be on this team. Um, if he's the Golden Boot winner, then is he the Player of the Year as well? That actually, the Player of the Year could be Victor Vasquez, just by what we've sort of seen in the the role that he's going to play. But how many minutes can he play in his legs? I get it. But you know, they didn't ask what the Defender of the Year was going to be, and I'm like, it's Jonathan Bond. I, I'm like, I wrote it in there. I'm like, Defender of the Year is going to be Jonathan Bond or Julian Bond if or Jonathan Ju and, Ju and 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 Araujo play like really well together. Maybe what they do is they Julian just put Bond. Julian on top of Jonathan Bond's shoulders, and then there's extra tall goalkeeper. What do you think? No? I like it. it continuing okay. that Georgia political emphasis as well. It's good. Good, good. I'm glad. I'm glad we figured that out. Um, but I think Jonathan Bond could absolutely have. In terms of preseasons, Jonathan Bond has had one of the best preseasons out of anybody on this roster. I think Adam Saldana had maybe the best preseason, and that's more just because he's coming from a surprise factor. Um, that we didn't expect Saldana to be, you know, uh, as as prevalent in this. And Saldana may have worked himself into a starting role again in the Miami game. I mean, that's not ridiculous to say. And certainly seeing this lineup, there's a chance of that. I'm not saying that that's the preferred lineup for Greg Vanny, but I think looking at where everything is right here, that may work. Things may change when Kevin Cabral comes in and and uh, and um, Sebastian Legette has to drop back into the midfield with Vasquez and Jonathan Do and and Jonathan Dos Santos as well. So understand that there's some flexibility and some things changing. But for the Miami game, that you know Saldana may actually get the start here, which I think is is really exciting. Um, You're going to see 15 field players anyways, and that heat and humidity. They're they're going to empty the bench. Yeah, I mean 15, 16 even right because five and 11 is is 16 if you do your math. 16. Well, 15 field players because oh, Julian, 15, Julian, Julian, Julian Jonathan Bond. Bond <laughs> I get what you're saying. Stay out there. I get what you're saying. No, it, may, it makes sense. So, um, but but that's what I say. You know, you you see this. I mean, there's a lot to take from this. The Galaxy were composed in possession, Kevin. They were, you know, running and supporting runs. And Victor Vasquez said it in his post game. I have his post game. I don't know that it's worth us playing it because it's it's more long and drawn out than really it probably needs to be. Um, but Vasquez says, you know, he's doing what Greg asked, which is not only to, you know, create the angles and create the offensive um, chances behind the defense. And that's what happened on the goal, um, but also to get support into the box. And that's what you saw. Sebastian Legette in the box, Chicharito in the box, um, <laughs> Victor Vasquez in the box. So, when you see that sort of support, I think the Galaxy are going to score more goals than people give them credit for. I think they've been unlucky in a lot of their chances so far. Maybe that's preseason, but also you'd want to see that starting to pay off already as well. I mean, Chicharito hit the hit the crossbar a couple times. Uh, he had some good shots saved. You know, there's things you really need that guy to get to get off to a start in Miami. If Chicharito scores in the Miami game, Kevin. The Galaxy may be good. If he doesn't score and it takes a while for him to get that goal, they, I, I really think that the Galaxy are going to suffer because he he's a confidence guy. He needs that confidence. He needs to score. And we didn't see that in the preseason. We, we haven't seen that in the preseason from him. And, and you know why what you're talking about, the confidence thing, is because if he doesn't score in the first game, what's everybody going to say? Oh, it's the Chicharito from last year. He does. He sees lost it. It's, and Chicharito is going to hear that, and he's going to read that, and he's going to think that maybe. Um, yeah, you're right. I think a goal from him in the first game, or at least playing really well. Remember, he he barely had any touches the first couple of games last year. Yeah. Uh, I think a good game by Chicharito with a goal would really help. Even without a goal, it will help his confidence a little bit. If, But you're right. If he gets off to a slow start, I think that momentum will build of, like, did he learn anything in the offseason? I, it's it's been really interesting because I, I've been getting a lot of blowback whenever I've watched Chicharito in these games. I've watched the runs he's making. I've watched the work and the effort. I've watched the defense. Remember, the defense is huge. Yeah. Do do you remember whenever everybody would talk to us about the defense and they're like, you know, the defense just doesn't isn't just the back line. You know, it starts with the with the striker at the top and the whole deal. 
all that BS that they were feeding us is actually true when you see it actually get played correctly, which was what we saw from Chicharito in this RSL game. He was poaching from the top. He was closing down angles. He was pressuring people into more pressure. That's how it's supposed to work. So, uh, you know, somebody said he didn't score goals. He has one job. No, Chicharito does not have one job. One of his most important job is to score goals. Actually, his most important job is to create offense, Kevin. And as long as he's making the right runs and he's doing the things that he's supposed to do, as long as the offense is being generated around him, then he's doing the correct thing that that is supposed to happen, and his goals will come. So I, I I'm I'm. I'm impressed with the work rate. I'm impressed with his understanding of what Vanny wants him to do. I'm impressed with the entire team's understanding of playing with the system because we're seeing a team right now that plays with the system. And I, it, I'm in a group chat with some some other people and we were going back and forth and saying stuff. And the whole thing is like, don't get excited. Like, yes, we all see what's going on, but don't get excited. Like, And I think that's that's good for Galaxy fans. Don't get excited by what you're seeing so far. There's been a lot of positives in a preseason that hasn't seen very many starters play, but we don't know how that's going to play out. We've, we've talked for years, Kevin, now about how the preseason doesn't matter until it does. And so right now, everything that we've seen in the preseason doesn't matter until we get into the season and see either the same problems or the growth that we saw in the preseason. Then we can say the preseason mattered. Otherwise, it's like... It's like a warm-up before a game. Uh, Dave Sarakin said one time, I asked Dave, I go, can you tell whether players are going to be good in warm-ups or not? He said, And he told me, you know, uh, specifically, he goes, I've seen guys go out there and warm up and hit every shot, and, like, they scored goals like crazy, and they were just, like, they were feeling it. They were on fire, and they went out and had an absolute horrible game. And I've seen guys trip over their feet um, and not be able to score goals, and, like, it looks like they can't even run, um, and they go out there and they have a wonderful game. He goes, so there's nothing you can draw from it except when there's the guy who hit every goal in in warm-ups and then went out and had a great game right it's 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 like afterwards you can say yeah the warm-up mattered but most of the time you you don't know and that's yeah, what this well, preseason you hear is. pitchers all the time said i had nothing in the bullpen and they go out and throw a no hitter it happens all the time but you're right about chicharito and the defense don't overlook that because if they're going to play they're not going to play a 4-3-3 the formation is a little different but if they're going to play this pressing kind of game they, that that Greg Vanny played in Toronto, which sort of seems to be where soccer's going. You know, this this high pressing, win the ball when you give it over. That's how you play defense in that pressing style. It's not a defense. It's win the ball when you lose it and and possession, short passing. If the Galaxy are going to do all those things, regardless of the formation, that means the striker has to come back and play a little defense. He has to win the ball back when he loses it. And, and it's not the kind of defense you play in the back line. It's not a lot of slide tackles. It's not a lot of physical stuff. It's it's harassing the opponent and winning the ball back and let and making it difficult for them to play it out of the back. That's what Chicharito is going to have to do. And I think he's he's proven uh, this winter that he wants to do that and then he can do that at times. No, no, I, I I think that's again. It is one of the bigger takeaways that we've seen um, in the preseason. So you know, if that ends up meaning something, it'll it'll end up meaning something. Let's talk a little bit. Um, we did get to see a very very small debut for for Sam Grancier and um, from O'Neill Fisher. O'Neill Fisher a little bit longer there. We, we said uh, Grancier went about 25 minutes, Fisher about 38 minutes. Uh, Grancier came off for Dunbar, so I'm expecting right now Dunbar starts in Miami um, just because I think Grancier might be able to give you 30 to 45 minutes, and I don't think you start him. I think maybe you bring him off the bench in that first game. Um, but Sam Grancier was out there. Um, both of these guys I was impressed with. And I know it's a small sample size. I get it, 100%. I'm not going to be one here who says that we have understood anything about Grants here. Um, Fisher, maybe a little bit more. Fisher's a veteran, Kevin. We've seen him play in this league. He acted like a veteran out there. He is a more than capable backup that will absolutely push Julian Araujo for a starting spot this year. Um, I think it's Araujo's um, until it's not Araujo's. So if he didn't feel the pressure last year, which he didn't because... Rolf Felcher is never going to pressure Julian Araujo out of a starting spot. Um, and if the Galaxy ha had a right wing last year, Araujo would have pushed Rolf Felcher right out of a starting spot at that right back. Um, I think O'Neill Fisher is a more than serviceable defender at right back. Had a great pass that opened up space, I think, to Leggett. Um, There was a nice little combo there. Um, he's just... He's the guy who gets it 
it, you're talking about veteran leadership on the back line along with Via Fania. Um, there are some guys here that are really adding to this culture. The LA Galaxy gave, uh, did you see this? They gave O'Neill Fisher an old camcorder um, for their trip to, to Arizona and they put together a video of it. And I'm like, come on, they gave him like, they shot it on his iPhone and then like they made it look like, no, he actually had like the old school camcorder. They may have had to like digitally like put the tape in and actually get it like digitized in order to be able to do stuff that they wanted to do. But you can tell that the guys like him and that he's a part of this team. And so for me, O'Neill Fisher, you know, seeing that 38 minutes, you know, almost the first full half for him is exactly what you wanted to see out of him. So I think we talk about where did the LA Galaxy get better? They got better on depth. Um, absolutely 100% on that they, defense. They have eight starters. You can, eight players that I would be comfortable starting. That, that doesn't mean though that's my first choice lineup, but he, Ocasta, he can start. You, we haven't even talked about Williams yet. Yep. I think they have eight capable starters on that back line and you can move them around interchange them, and you're going to need to do that i think you said last week 17 times 15 they're going to play 15 times they play with short rest yep yeah that's ha almost half the it's almost half the schedule is is on short rest um and so look at guys like julian arajo like o'neill fisher like danilo acosta jorge viafania Derek williams um actually was back in training got to actually train with the team he is starting to move but he's not going to be ready for miami yet and we obviously we didn't see him in this game um he's there people gonzalez i don't think is still back to training so people ask where he is i i he, they said it was a bone bruise and that it's not gonna and he had injections and there's you know some stuff in his knee we'll we'll sort of wait for that to see how that all plays out but as of right now a tam defender um people gonzalez who didn't see a whole bunch of playing time last year mostly because his playing time um, it hasn't been good um, whenever he has played is has injured right now and we haven't seen him at all really in this preseason so um, for people Gonzalez the sort of you know this is it I imagine this is his last year with the LA Galaxy now we say that all the time and then all of a sudden there's like bonus years that we never knew uh, even existed so um, but I imagine that people Gonzalez is either gone at the end of the year or gone during the summer perhaps uh, going back to Aula Hense wh who, who wants him and he wants to go back um, so eventually that I think will, will end, but we haven't seen people Gonzalez there. We haven't seen Derek Williams, who is probably the starter once things actually get moving. Um, so that's another thing that we're probably going to see an upgrade at center back there as well. Um, with Derek Williams coming in. So <laughs> a lot of there's, there's so much fun that there was, I, I mean, I can see it from galaxy fans, Kevin, you and I have to watch these games um and whenever it's not exciting we we feel that we feel the boringness there were plenty of galaxy games last year where you're like they're they're not going to hold on to this this lead they're not going to do this they're not going to be competitive in this game and for the most part they weren't um this year already um in the you know one game i got to see in person and some of those other things you can see that this team seems like at least you know initially is going to be a competitive more fun to watch team. Maybe maybe that won't be the case, but they look like that in preseason. And, and I think the defense is the biggest pro, uh, you know issue, the biggest change. Because last year, I think I think teams were able to absorb pressure, and they watched Legit and and Pavone for the most part. I don't think Chicharito was out so much of the year, anyways. But even when he was on the field, I don't think they feared him. So th what they did is they just absorbed pressure and waited for a counterattack, knowing that that defense was soft and that they would get an opportunity to beat that. I don't see that happening this year, especially if Greg gets that that uh, holding midfielder that he's still looking for, apparently. Uh, I yeah, I don't know. We'll have to see whether um, uh, Cabral is really the offensive weapon that people think he is and whether they, again, are sort of one or two-dimensional on, on offense. But 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 even if they do, I don't think teams can play them the same way because I think this defense is pretty stout, and I don't think they're going to get beat on counterattacks nearly as often as they got beaten on, on them last year. I want to make sure I, I get through this this time because I keep getting distracted by by other things. But Grant Sear, um, I thought, was confident, ran into good spaces, made himself available for the ball, drifted into good position, switched sides at one point. So I think you're going to see uh, Vanny having, giving him some freedom to move, Kevin, uh, move around to different spots, be able to interchange with ever who's on the left wing, right wing. That interchange is going to be confusing. And you even saw him cut into the middle. He had a good left-footed shot um, cutting in from the right-hand side um, and able to sort of fight are in there as well so seeing those things happen um you know at least gives me an idea that he will be a a good addition in 25 minutes that's really what we've been able to watch in 25 minutes i'm ready to say that he's going to be a good addition to the galaxy but you you didn't see anything that was a warning sign there he didn't look overly rusty he just needs to be in game shape um, but that, what is he 24 
Is he that old? Uh, is he younger? Or is he 26? I, I think he's 24. I think uh, you're right. Yeah, I, I think I thought he was 24, and then and then we know Cabral is 21. And what I wanted to say about that is when you look at these guys, you know, when some players come over from Europe, it's like, oh, they're at the end of their career. You know, they're not really motivated to play. They, they're just here for a last paycheck. These two guys are young players who were young and dynamic players and were thought of very highly. We're talking about now Cabral and Grant Sear in France. They've come over here in the case of Cabral with his option. It's a six-year deal. Right. He's not going to be here through 25 and 26. He's going back to Europe. These guys are motivated to show that they didn't have a chance to play in Monaco and then in the French second division. No one noticed them there. This is their chance to shine, to prove themselves. I think both these guys come over here highly motivated. It's not one of those things where, oh, you know, deal, you know, uh, oh my God, I got sent to, to America. What am I going to do? They're motivated to get back. In the case of Vasquez, he's motivated in the exact opposite way. He knows this is probably the last stop. He wants to end it on a high note. Nobody wants to end their career like Willie Mays batting 193 and, you know, striking out all the time. They want to end it on a high note. Vasquez wants to win another title here, and he, he's, he knows he's got a year or two to do it. And, and these two guys, they want to go back to Europe. And that that long contract, and, and then the other thing with Cabral, the money on the contract, if you remember – um, with the deal with Cincinnati, um, they get $50,000 for each time the Galaxy hold, makes it. Hold on. Let's explain that because okay. um, on Thursday night, we got so lost in a bunch of MLS rules that I didn't get a good job to explain it. So the LA Galaxy, I'll set it up and then you can get the details. Okay. The LA Galaxy paid FC Cincinnati $250,000 in general allocation money for the discovery rights to Kevin Cabral. Apparently, FC Cincinnati wrote his name down on a list. So, the, so then they got to negotiate with the Galaxy for how much it was going to cost. $250,000, by the way, in general allocation money for discovery rights is a large number for Major League Soccer. But there was a kicker in there and Kevin has the details on it where nobody else has the details on this because it was kind of it was adjusted out of some things um, whenever they whenever they put some stuff out. But basically, um, here, I'll let you explain it. So there's fifty thousand well, dollars, right? Right. Well, the language was changed and, it, and I'm not sure whether Cincinnati wanted to change or the galaxy. But basically, we're talking about one hundred thousand dollars. It's fifty thousand dollars in additional money that goes to Cincinnati each time the Galaxy make the playoffs with Cabral up to 100000 So in other right. words, they can only do it twice. Right. The original language was if they make it in the first two seasons, they have to make it in 2021, 2022, then Cincinnati gets the money. Cincinnati said, no, wait a minute. This is a five-year deal with an option. Any time during that six years, if the Galaxy make the playoffs with Cabral, we get $50,000 up to 100000 Now, again, that that just kind of tells me that the that the Galaxy the said, okay, fine, we'll do that. Right. I, I, the, the, the length of the contract, I, I think it's just to make Cabral comfortable. I just he doesn't seem to be like a guy who's going to be here for more than three, maybe four seasons. Right. He's going back to Europe. The Galaxy are giving him a chance to shine, and that's great because it's just going to help the Galaxy. If he has a couple of great seasons, you know, think about Antuna. Went, you know, had uh, a you know good season here and was able to sign with Chivas, and now is a big star in Mexico. I mean, it, you know, Cabral could do the same thing. Yeah, it, it, that means that eventually there could be a $350,000 general allocation money deal, and you would expect the Galaxy to make the playoffs in two of those. So, um, we'll Or they transfer him for 10 or, or, or $20 million. I mean, right. you know, I, I think Galaxy makes money on this thing, I think, at the end of the day. I, I mean, that's the idea, right? Um, I made a, a list, by the way. It's on my uh, Kevin Cabral story on the website, but I'll, I'll share it with everybody here because I didn't have it last time. It's just sort of the young DP rule. The other thing is that he's 21, Kevin. Eventually, he's going to be 23, and anybody who's 24 years um, or I think 25 years old, or actually, no, excuse me, it's 24. You age out of the young DP slot the year you turn 24. So the LA Galaxy have sort of a ticking clock on that young DP. He would have to be transferred into a normal designated player, which then would have an effect on the U22 initiative that we've sort of talked about and why the LA Galaxy, um, you know, made him a young DP and some, some other things that are sort of in that, um, it, it, the LA Galaxy, and it was told to me specifically, and I'll, I'll recap a little bit from Thursday, like the young designated player deal for Kevin Cabral, one, because his salary made it made him a young DP and not a U22. If you make more than the maximum budget charge, then you have to be a young DP if you're under the uh, the age cutoff of 23 or, or actually 24 years old. You have to be less than 24 um, for that. So um, that's why they did it. And in doing that, they get to now sign 
up to three U22 initiative players. If they made him um, a young DP or if they had three senior designated players like they did last year with Jonathan Dos Santos, Chicharito, and Christian Pavone, then they would only get to sign one U22 player. So the Galaxy are hinging a lot of the success not only on Kevin Cabral doing things that they expect him to do, Kevin, but also getting those three U22 players um, in there as well. And so we will see how that progresses because I think if they don't at least have two U22 players on this roster sort of by the end of the year, that they really haven't fulfilled the the benefit of have making uh, Kevin Cabral a young designated player. But and the, then the $350,000 in general allocation money comes into play as well. So it's a significant amount of money they spent just on discovery rights and then a significant amount of money, Kevin, to bring Kevin Cabral to the United States. So um, very interesting, uh, all, all the twists in that deal. Yeah, and I, th I think, you know, it's one of those things that Galaxy are taking a little bit of a of a flyer, hoping this guy is what they think he uh, can be and will be. And uh, the finances are set up that way. As you said, it's a clicking, uh, it's, a, it's a ticking clock. They have to get him to 24 before they have to make a decision. And, and you know, maybe he'll be ready to sell by then. Maybe Dunbar and some of these other guys will be, if Brian Alvarez will be ready to come in and take over that starting spot. Um, another thing that I heard from the Galaxy in their, pre, in their final preseason game that, that Greg and Vasquez were talking about afterwards was how they liked the fact that they have some older players like a Vasquez, like a, like a Dos Santos, to bring some of these young players like Efrain. Well, Efrain's been around a little while, but Dunbar and, and some of these other players um, that are really benefiting from having some veterans who have been around the block a little bit, kind of helping them come along. Again, if we look at this as a work in progress, that makes a lot of sense. You got some coaches on the field helping some young guys come along. Yeah, it, it's, it's again, it's going to be, um, I, I think there's a good mix. Um, I like the mix so far. So we'll see how that plays out again, preseason. This is, this is game week number one, Kev. We're, we're in week one of MLS 2021. Um, and the Galaxy will play a real live game on Sunday as it goes. Now, there is a question. One of the better players in this preseason has been Sebastian Lejet, who was with the U.S. men's national team for some time, um, came back, and he, he's been playing well. He seems to be uh, motivated. He seems to be in shape. Uh, he does a lot of the right things. He's energy within that, and this could be the year that we will finally see the real breakout Sebastian Lejet. He seems to be... Uh, focused on and in this offensive scheme. Uh, he was playing out wide, but I don't expect him to stay there. I actually expect him to be brought back in eventually. I don't know that that happens in Miami, but eventually he'll be brought back into the inside in the center to be next to Victor Vasquez um, and possibly Jonathan Dos Santos in there and maybe S S Sasha Kleschen at one point or another. So um, there seems to be a lot of focus, but Sebastian Legette got himself in some trouble. Um, it's a... Sebastian Legette posted a video to his Instagram. Now, let me set up the scene a little bit for this. So that way we can try to put it in the proper context because I think context is important in this discussion. Uh, you're going to see, and, and certainly there was an article in OutSports that said that Sebastian Legette posted um, a gay slur, a homophobic slur um, to his Instagram video. What Sebastian Legette did was uh, he and Julian Rajo and Jonathan Dos Santos and I think Efrain Alvarez um, throughout the preseason have been playing a game and the game is that they go back and you try to slap the person on the back of the net. You try to sneak up to on them and you, like a lot of times it's walking out to training. That's usually when these guys get them and stuff like that, but they've been filming it. You know, you walk out, you try to get it and you try to slap them on the back of the neck before they realize that you're right behind them, right? That's the the whole idea. That's the game. I've played many, many stupid games in sports where we had like games going on. One of them, which was to uh, flick the other person in the, in the, in the, let's see, in the testicles. I was trying to say, I was trying to figure out a way to make it like, you know, not sound horrible, but regardless of how that was, yeah, you tried to flick somebody in the testicles. Um, Harder to do with some people than others. <laughs> absolutely true. <laughs> um, so, so, you know, that was a game I, and I remember playing sports and, and doing that one. And that was really sports, stupid. Sports is not really deep folks. If you haven't <laughs> caught on by I was going to say, I say real, real sort of, you know, off. That's that's as shallow as it gets. So, um, the whole deal. And whenever uh, Legette did that, um, he used uh, a homophobic slur. I'll say it here. If it offends you, I apologize. But in the uh, interest of the news, I, I think it's important for us to say it. But he basically said, you know, I puto. Um, and we Which know is that's the the, the chant that go, that Mexican national team fans have traditionally used for goal kicks, opposing goal kicks, and they've been sanctioned by it many times uh, by, by, by FIFA. FIFA. Yeah, correct. And we know that MLS is MLS and the LA Galaxy have tried to stamp that word out of uh, all the um, all the games played in the United States. So uh, the, the radar is out for that. Is the point? 
and that's and that's the setting that this puts it in. Now, the context of this is that that word has many different meanings to many different people, and I'm not going to tell you whether or not you should believe that it's not homophobic or it is homophobic. I'm just I want to make sure that you understand that there isn't one meaning that everybody agrees on, and we have words like that in English as well. Um, quite honestly, gay is a word that we put associate with a bunch of different things, and depending on how you use it within the context, it could be a homophobic slur. Uh, you could say that you're happy, or you could be describing some somebody who is homosexual. All those things are, are a, a context of that word. Um, and so, and so Sebastian Legette posted this on his, uh, Instagram story. And for that, he, he's, he's stupid. All right. And he, he shouldn't have done that because certainly we all know Kevin, like you said, major league soccer, FIFA, there is, everybody's on the outlook uh, on the lookout for this word. And it got posted and Outsports picked it up and rightfully, you know, sort of, I, I guess, uh, held Sebastian Legette to, to the fire about it. Um, what happened after that is that Sebastian Legette put out what the uh, writer of the original article, uh, Sid C Ziegler, did I say it right? It's Sid Ziegler, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, Sid Ziegler said was, uh, he said, uh, and I quote, for athletes and publicists looking for how to apologize when you say something homophobic, Sebastian Legette has given you the blueprint. Flawless. Now, there's a lot that goes into that apology too, Kevin, because we know that uh, Sebastian Legette immediately took the video down. Uh, we know that Julian Araujo, who reposted it, also had, took that video down, although whenever it gets reposted and pulled down, it, it gets pulled down from both um, on the certain things. Um, so, so they have that as well. And then not only did Sebastian Legette issue an apology, but he called Sid on the phone and talked to him, what, for 10 or 15 minutes or something like that? Yeah. Let me pick up on this. I, I know Sid pretty well. He's a very opinionated guy. He and I have worked together on a lot of stories. Um, he's the co-founder of Outsports, which is a uh, a website that covers gay uh, sports, gay athletes. It's primarily educational. There's a lot of, of also inspirational stories. Sid's opinion has always been that uh, the idea that's, that that uh, gays will not be accepted in the locker room is wrong and that when teammates come out, they, they are overwhelmingly supported by by uh, you know, by the rest of the guys on the team, and, and and he feels like that's the truth, and he's and there's a lot of evidence to show that, and th and that's, I don't want to say a crusade, but he's been sort of uh, going after that story for a long time. He's the co-founder of that uh, website with a guy named Jim Bozinski, who used to be the assistant sports editor at the Long Beach Paper, now uh, works as a copy editor at the LA Times, um, and so this sport, uh, sport, uh, website has been around for a couple of decades. It, it's primarily at this point educational. And that, and I talked to Sid on Saturday after he spoke to Sebastian. Um, and he said Sebastian's apology to him was heartfelt. It was sincere. And then he said, you know, I, I don't need Sebastian to apologize. You know, I, I, if he's not apologizing to me. We don't need that. What the idea is, is what he tried to get across to Sebastian is that when you say things that some people can interpret as hateful, that it makes it difficult and makes people feel bad. And I, I think that's kind of where I come down on this word too, is there are other words, you know, if somebody, if it, if it hurts somebody, makes somebody feel bad, you know, don't use it. Don't tell me what it means in Ecuador or how it's translated in Spain. If somebody is bothered by that word, you don't have to use it. But getting back to what you were saying about Sebastian, not only did Sebastian take that down, the Galaxy issued a statement, Sebastian issued a statement, 99 out of 99 instances, that's all you would hear. Sebastian ended his statement stanking out sports, saying, thank you for holding my feet to the fire. Thank you for making me responsible. Thank you for calling me out. I will be better. And then he called Sid and they spoke for 10 minutes. And again, Sebastian apologized. And he thanked Sid for the opportunity to learn. Um, and he's absolutely right. That's the way to handle this. Um, out sports, again, you know, they, they, been educational on, on some of these issues. They have called people out. The Galaxy once had a gay pride night, and during that gay pride night, the, the homophobic chant was used in the stadium, and Outsports was all over that. They also did right. a lot of positive coverage of Robbie Rogers and his relationship with Landon Donovan. Um, so, it, you know, they've been very fair about this issue, and, and I, I think they're absolutely right about Sebastian Legette. Textbook response to this, a way to get out in front of it, not making excuses thanking them for the opportunity to learn, not saying he could very easily have said some of the things that we talked about here. Hey, that word, and I'm our, my family's from Argentina. We don't see that word that way. I'm sorry. No, he didn't do that. I offended somebody. I'm sorry for it. The league then, without calling the Galaxy, without talking to Sebastian, without right. talking to, to Sid, and let's face it, if Sid hadn't run his story on Outsports, we probably wouldn't be talking about this. Right. Without talking to anyone, the, the league came out and said, 
uh, Sebastian Legette is now under investigation for this. I, I don't know that they named him. In they, the they didn't. I, I have it. It says, uh, and I quote, Major League Soccer is committed to providing an environment in which all individuals are treated with dignity and respect, and we have no tolerance for discrimination and prejudice of any kind. We are aware of the use of a homo homophobic slur by an LA Galaxy player. MLS has begun a formal investigation regarding the language used by the player, and more information will be provided as soon as it becomes available. Now, that's just ridiculous. It doesn't name the player. No one learns anything from that because we don't, we don't talk about the slur. We don't say who said it. We don't say the context as you did. We don't talk about out sports getting the apology. We don't talk about the fact that Galaxy and, and Sebastian issued these statements. Um, the league is just grandstanding, um, and, and they've done that over and over and over again. I'm getting out of my soapbox for just a second. I'll yield back my time to the uh, to the, the gentlewoman the, from Costa the, Mesa. I was going to say distinguished <laughs> gentleman from Costa Mesa. But – they did it with Black Lives Matter. You know, they they did the whole thing at MLS's back and everyone had to wear the shirts. And then when MLS players wanted to boycott the game after the NBA did because of the second shooting uh, uh, that took place in Milwaukee, all of a sudden the league was like, no, 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 we can't do that. There's too much money at stake. The league loves to jump on, a, uh, on some of these issues and try to make it take advantage of them and make themselves look good without ever really advancing the cause. And that's what this statement strikes me as as oh we're going to say something because this will allow us to look good but we're really not going to try to affect any change if they were they would have left it alone because sebastian legit is already or they would have praised sebastian legit now maybe they do have to fine him because they can't uh, they can't create a precedent for the next person who comes along and does this and doesn't do what sebastian did but i think if there was a suspension or any kind of severe penalty that would be totally ridiculous because then what's what's the what's the upside? What's the the motivation for the next player to do what Sebastian did and take ownership of this and apologize? I, I just I really get upset when MLS grandstands like this because you can tell there's no sincerity at all behind what they're saying. No, no, and I I think you know looking at Sebastian and again you don't want to be the I know the guy he's not homophobic but. I mean, I, I think know the guy. He's not hopeful. I, I was going to say, in, yeah. in this particular case, you can see what, what Sebastian is. He's going to take it as a learning experience, the whole deal. Now, let's get to what I actually think the league is going to do. Um, and I think here, here's the problem is that anybody who has used a homophobic slur that has been either heard on television or heard on a hot mic or that type of thing on, in, in MLS has received basically a three game suspension. And you could go back to, um, you know, Colin Clark, who the galaxy eventually signed after his incident. Uh, Alan Gordon got in trouble whenever he was with the San Jose earthquakes. Again, three games, three games. Uh, there's some others in there as well. I see MLS as not being able to understand the context in this. I see MLS as they're going to make an example, and I would not be surprised um, if MLS suspends Sebastian Legette for three games because that's the cookie cutter answer and that's what it is. And as I think you're rightfully pointed out, and I understand the defense people, and I think you were right. There's other words to use. Let's use another word, right? Let's 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 get around. Let let let's let's do that. And because I want people to be comfortable at soccer games, right? And and I think you know Sebastian understands that as well. So let's use you know another word. However, we were going to use it, and I understand the different cultural contexts and all those things as well. Um, but I don't think MLS is going to take the time to do any of that stuff, and I think it's going to end up hurting. Um, the overall message of what can actually, I mean, you know, find Sebastian Legette, tell him that he has to do community service and wherever he's going to do community service with some LGBTQ plus organization that, um, they're going to donate that fine money to that organization and, and, you know, call, and he's going to do it, you know, 10 hours or 15 hours of educational stuff and working with people and blah, 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 and helping, uh, you know, kids who are LGBTQ plus, um, to, to really, um, you know, reach for the stars and, and not feel, and, and feel like they can come out and play play sports and do all that stuff. I mean, that's where this goes. And I don't want to sound either, Kevin, like we're being homers on this, that we, well, we know Sebastian. And so therefore, you know, we can make it, it just anything else that has been done in terms of a homophobic slur in major league soccer has been yelled at in anger, um, has been the context of even the chant itself is an adversarial chant. It's not a, Oh, everybody loves us chant. And when you look at Sebastian Legette and Julian Rajo, it's, it was not in that context. It was not adversarial. Um, so I, you know, I, I, I imagine that you and I will both be raked over the coals, regardless of which side we sit on on this. I think there's better words. I think MLS is, can, can get rid of this, but at the same time, Suspending Sebastian Legette for any amount of time in this particular case seems like it would be not understanding the context in which it was used. Um, so MLS, not that they're smart enough to take advantage of this and not that they understand nuance at all, 
there's a way out for MLS to uh, also adhere to the Alan Gordon rule and let Sebastian off. And that would be, it wasn't directed at a opponent, it was directed at a teammate. It wasn't in a game, it was in practice. Uh, he And then the apology. The apology has to be part of it. Otherwise, I mean, we saw the, the instance with the loyal last year in Phoenix Rising when the player made that uh, homophobic comment against a gay player on the San Diego loyal and Landon Donovan refused to play the rest of the game. That player said, I never said that. An investigation proved that he did, and he and the coach were both suspended. Um, Sebastian didn't even try that. Sebastian came up right out and said, hey, I, I screwed up and I take responsibility yeah. for it. Yeah, but don't we see that and all athletes are always going to no, apologize? No, I, not to this degree. I mean, I, I'm asking MLS to, again, consider You're right. the, 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 to consider the the surroundings. No, I, you, you do hear people say, yeah, I'm sorry. And they issue a statement. I I, I don't see the... The, the level of ownership that Sebastian took on this. Um, you're right. It, I am a little bit of a homer on this. I do know Sebastian. I do think that uh, that he is remorseful, as Sid said. And, and um, I do think that he's learned from it. I, I just don't see it as it, in the same Right, being being cut from the same cloth as some of these other. I, I agree. We should we should point out uh, neither of us are, are homosexual, so we really can't stick our foot into that and and tell you how what somebody who is gay uh, thinks about that particular slur. I can't tell you what it means uh, to that person, and it may be very hurtful, and you know that may be something that I can't. I'm also not Latino, um, and I can't look at it from from that point of view as well. So I realize that you know the last ten minutes of us trying to sort of break this down comes from two guys who were sort of looking from the outside yeah. in on it. Um, I don't think that context should be removed from our conversation either. No, we're pr two privileged white guys talking about what happened to other people. But I would love to. I mean, you know, we're pretty easy to find on social media. I would love to hear from, um, uh, you know, some gay fans that in the, the galaxy have a lot of gay fans. That there's a gay pride night every year. I'd like to hear what and I've heard from them in the past on issues. I'd love to hear from them what they think about this. Does Sebastian deserve a pass or were they just as offended as they were when Alan Gordon, Alan Gordon said, said it, it, yeah, or or Colin Clark said it, and that. I'd that like thing. to hear that perspective because I like Sebastian Legette would like to learn from this as well. So uh, anyway, this, so I mean, when we look at Miami, and let's take this to the LA Galaxy side of things. When we look at Miami, will Sebastian Legette be in Miami? I think you're going to say yes, Kevin, that he will be. Um, he should be. I'll say that. Okay. Um, I will say that right now, I I don't trust MLS at all. So um, in my particular, I will say no, he won't. Here's the thing, though. It is Monday night as we're recording. I will tell you that from what I at least understand, and it's an outside perspective and certainly asking people who may not 100% know, but MLS has not issued any sort of edict on Sebastian Legette either publicly or privately right now that we can tell. And maybe that comes on Tuesday morning. There, it's a ticking clock. You, If you're MLS, you have to notify the LA Galaxy if something's going to happen because if not, then the first game of the season, uh, you're, if you have to prepare without Sebastian Legette, you need to know that. You need to know if Sebastian Legette's not going to play the next three games for the LA Galaxy. Um, all those things need to happen and it needs to happen quickly or you need to tell the LA Galaxy, we need to investigate this for the next three weeks before we can sort of issue anything and then we'll let you know what it is. You have to give the Galaxy a footprint or a timeline for this because... If they draw it out, that's fine. You just have to let the galaxy know. If they're going to be quick, then and there's going to be punishment, then then make that punishment known now. The LA Galaxy need to know that heading into a game week. So um, I think that's where we stand. We'll, we're going to update, uh, and Kevin and I, of course, are already on the story. Um, so if it comes out um, and, and anything, uh, an edict from uh, you know Don Garber or, or Major League Soccer and, and their investigation will let you know. But as of right now, I don't expect Sebastian Legette to be in Miami for this game because I think MLS is going to suspend him. And, and if he wasn't there, you would say it's not that big a deal anyways because Miami hasn't played a game in the preseason and barely has a roster for this game. Well, I mean, it, you know, they had a whole bunch of COVID stuff at the the beginning, so it made them cancel, I think, all well, the preseason Florida? games. Yeah, I'm COVID in Florida? Uh, surprise. Uh, yeah, wow. It doesn't seem to be a problem that's going to stop this game. I need to reiterate that. Um, Miami did, by the way, I want to point this out. Some people on our Discord, and if you haven't joined our Discord, do. We have, there's so many different rooms and channels in there that you can sort of get information. And some of our Discord members said, hey, Miami just canceled our tickets um, to the game. And they had bought 
tickets off the you know the the aftermarket and some other ways. And I know that I think Miami gave up to a hundred tickets for traveling supporters actually to go to this game as well. Um, so there's a large contingent. I think if you're part of that hundred supporters who are traveling to Miami um, and you got the supporters tickets through the LA Galaxy or the supporters groups, I think you're fine. I don't think you're going to be affected by this. If it's aftermarket though, they canceled some tickets and basically said we had to reconfigure the stadium, and so we're canceling your tickets. And then there were tickets available for those people to go back up. But there is a chance that people didn't get that email, um, that they didn't know that they got canceled, and that now they don't have tickets to a game they had already bought tickets for um, to this Miami game. So ch check your tickets. If you're listening and you're going to Miami, check your tickets. Um, because I don't want you to go there and find out that they canceled your tickets and you don't you don't got a seat now and you went to Miami, you know, not to watch a game and stand outside. Florida isn't that nice that you should go there and stand out as, outside a stadium. You don't got seats? Is that what you said? You, you don't, don't got, got seats. seats. I was I was trying to, okay. you know, I was trying to emphasize things with some some lingo in that particular case. All right. Um, I, I would argue that Miami is a pretty, pretty nice place though. I, I lived there for seven years. I liked it. Yeah, I think you really can. humid. Yeah, I was eh, I, the weather there is not good enough for me to to recommend, you know, staying in Miami for any period of time. And they're not actually in Miami, right? They're in uh is it Fort Lauderdale or they Well, out? that's why I keep saying South Florida when I talk about it, because I'm yes. not sure if they're still playing in Fort Lauderdale or if they've moved to the downtown stadium no, they're in not Miami down, yet. Yeah, they're not downtown, so I think they're still, so they're in, Fort still in Fort Lauderdale. Lauderdale. Yeah. By the way, if you do go there, go to the beach. It's like bath water. It's, you know, you you a nice warm day in Southern California, the water is still real cold. Yeah. Miami, it's like bath water. Uh, I'll tell you this about that water. Whenever it gets warm, that's how you get hurricanes. Cold water is good. Okay, cold well, water. Well, it's, is it's coming into hurricane season. It starts in June. That's that's. I'm sure that's what's going to happen. It's going to be a surprise hurricane. They won't get to play this game for whatever reason. I feel like this game will not be played. But they do have. They had. They have their four designated player problem that we were also following. Uh, it looks like that uh, Pellegrini is looking to actually be moving to Montreal um, and Montreal is going to, uh, you know, accept him um, for this particular, which would mean that roster compliance has been met. By the way, roster compliant date for the LA Galaxy is the 16th. Um, so it's the it's the first day of the season. There's two games that get played on that Friday night um, and that is the roster compliance date. So the LA Galaxy have to be roster compliant by the 16th. We'll know what the actual roster is. I've already been inquiring. They don't have that. There's some question marks for the LA Galaxy whether or not Augie Williams is going to get signed to the senior team that's a question mark i think that being it hasn't been announced that there's probably less of a chance of that happening um already so look at how the yellow galaxy fill out that roster what spaces they're holding open that type of thing that's going to be on the 16th but miami has to have their roster compliant on the 16th as well um and it looks like they're going to be able to do that so they haven't played any preseason games kevin it looks like they're going to be roster compliant um if the yellow galaxy ever had a chance to go on the road and steal one this seems like a good one to go on the road and steal. But the LA Galaxy are more put together right now than than Inter Miami, um, well, and that, that's saying something. But that's why I was saying that whatever happens in this game, I don't think is going to be indicative of the regular season because the Galaxy Galaxy are still putting their guys together, and Miami may or may I mean they may surprise us. But right now, it doesn't look like they're going to be a competitive sort of middle of you know a mid season type form. Uh, for this game. So it's the Galaxy's only East Coast road trip, by the way. Uh, yes. the, only, the only time they'll be but beyond the central time zone, I believe. Uh, yeah, it, just a reminder that, you know, Miami still will have uh, Gonzalo Higuain, uh, Rodolfo Pizarro, um, and uh, Blaise Matute as well. So there is plenty of talent on that field. They have three senior designated players. The LA Galaxy will not have Kevin Cabral. Let's talk about that one more time just to make sure. Uh, I talked to the LA Galaxy today. They told me specifically that Cabral is not expected to be in Los Angeles this week. I think they were hoping that he would be in Los Angeles by the end of the week and then get in, start his quarantine. Um, and possibly be ready for that New York Red Bulls game that comes up uh, the following Sunday on April 25th. Um, that does not seem to be the case yet. Uh, I think they are expecting him to be in early next week. There's a possibility that that quarantine then, Kevin, is only five days five days of quarantine, a lot of testing that goes on, and then the ability to play. That's what we saw with, I believe, Grant Thieu and uh, with Victor Vasquez as well. Five days, and then you're able to train and play with the team. Although, I went through, and I went because I'm a nerd, Kevin, and I actually downloaded MLSs, and for the people on the audio I'm showing, I have a 32-page PowerPoint presentation from the league on their health and safety overview, um, and it mandates things basically like charters that we talked about. It mandates, that, it mandates on the bus, Kevin, that, they, that bus capacities are held to 50%, um, which, by the way, 
for an MLS team traveling, everybody gets their own row anyway. So I doubt that that's really a major issue, but maybe it well, mandated. Last, maybe- last year they had to get two buses. They, were, so, they had to get two buses for every trip. So so two buses probably again. Um, they're mandating charters, um, a lot of same day travel, which we, we know and, and sort of, it, which let's watch and see. We haven't got the, I don't think as we're sitting here right now that we have gotten to see um the la galaxy's weekly schedule it usually comes out on monday i know that they were busy and i was talking to them today today uh, was a day off no uh, the, the team got back from tucson i guess yesterday and today was a day off so nobody was at at the stadium they flew saturday night into um back to la so they get they played saturday saturday night they were back in la sunday was a day off i imagine today was a recovery day so yeah i was um, told i was told no one was at the stadium today unless they were in the trainer's room yeah so so maybe that was the case um and but we do we we kind of want to know when they're going to travel right and this seems like one of the cases where the yellow galaxy will not travel the day of the game um i think they'll go friday that's what I thought too, but when you think about it, the game on Sunday, that's still like the overnight there is probably a Saturday, like a Saturday morning trip, and then you get there in the afternoon, and then you sleep, and then you play the next day. But I'm with you. I would think that maybe they would leave on Friday um, and and do that, which means that our media availability might be Thursday um, with them in that media call. So I'm hoping that's the case because I would rather do a Thursday show um, with a media availability on Thursday morning, uh, then it be on Friday morning and, and sort of push everything out. Well, to, well to here's why I think I'm pretty sure they're going to travel Friday, but one, because last year they were going to travel on Friday. So you would think Good. whatever thinking went into that would, would hold. Yeah. yeah and but the they, other thing is, is it's a six hour trip. So if they leave on Saturday at six in the morning, they're going right. to get there, you know, at, at, at noon plus three. So 3 PM. And um, they're going to play at 3 PM yeah. Miami time. So, They'd be there 24 hours before, and that's if they left at six in the morning, which they're not going to do. So they would be there 24 hours before they had to play. I, I, I think they give them one extra day to adjust the time. Now, you throw all that stuff out the window when you go to altitude, Salt Lake or Colorado, because right. the idea is you get in and out within 24 hours to adjust right. to the altitude. Now, I, 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 I who knows? I think they go Friday. Okay. Well, well, we will see. This is us speculating because we haven't seen that uh, that uh, weekly schedule come out yet. So um, that's sort of where we sit with the LA Galaxy. Just a reminder about the game. Uh, the game coming up is on April 18th. It's a 12 p.m. Pacific time kickoff. This game is broadcast on ABC. Um, so it is an over-the-air game. It is a nationally televised game. Um, I was actually talking with one of the broadcasters today uh, about um, the LA Galaxy and sort of what we've seen in the preseason. I imagine that those conversations will continue throughout this week as as uh, everybody gets ready for this ABC game. Uh, so this is it. Um, I would like to remind everybody, and I think that it will be humorous that I remind everybody, Kevin, that the first three games will count towards the U.S. Open Cup. So if the LA Galaxy go out and win the first game against Miami, I think you could reasonably say they're still with, still in the hunt for an MLS uh, or U.S. Open Cup Um uh, debut? Did I say MLS Cup before? I probably did. I, U.S. I, Open Cup. I think I might give you a hundred dollars if anyone says we're right in the Open Cup hunt now. Oh, we got those three wins. We're. I'm. I mean, if they get three wins, they're going to the U.S. Open Cup. I mean, I'm telling you that. If, the, yeah. If anyone mentions that, though, I, I would be stunned. I mean, I'm going to mention it if they win. So I know you I, are. So I could get a hundred dollars because you said if anybody does, and I'm anybody. That's so true. just write that check. Oh, if I don't they, know if you're anybody. I don't. You're, if they lose, Kevin, I'm going to say it, and then you still owe me a hundred dollars. So I'm. This is. I'm all in on this for sure. Um. Anyway, so that's what it is. April 18th, 12 p.m. Pacific time kickoff, uh, Inter Miami, uh, against the LA Galaxy. David Beckham versus uh, his old team, which is kind of fun to sort of see you're gonna have a guy whose statue is in front of the stadium and when you're playing against him that just seems really weird i mean that's fun but it's the same thing when michael jordan goes to chicago with the hornets right you know because his statue is in front of the united center yeah it's it's, exactly see this is this is just mls being big time that's what that shows i'm sure i I think what i'm going to ask is sebastian's legit if he gets fine it's the hundred dollars that i have to pay you that's that's fine we can we can make that happen as well seba can pay me a hundred dollars you can pay me a hundred dollars anybody can pay me a hundred dollars that's fine i'm i will gladly take it um all right anything else that you want to get to i think we've covered most of the stuff that we've seen for the galaxy yeah, right I, I just want to reiterate again i'm really sincere if people uh, differ with us or if people support us on this whole thing i'd really like to know because we are people who um you know i we're nice guys but we don't really have our you know a, an iron in the fire on this and and uh, other than just trying to live in society and do the right thing but i would like to know how people um that are impacted this uh, in a much more 
um, uh, you know, personal way, how they feel about this. Yeah, it, uh, you can always hit up the comments in on YouTube or you can send us uh, at Twitter. So we will uh, get all that for you. All right. If you are looking for Mr. Kevin the Panda Baxter on Twitter, it is at kbaxter11. Head on over to uh, latimes.com where you can find Kevin's writings. He's covering the teams of Southern California, U.S. Men's National Team, U.S. Women's National Team across the country as well. Make sure you check out all of Kevin's stuff at kbaxter11, latimes.com. All right, if you're looking for me on Twitter, it's at jgesman, J-G-U-E-S-M-A-N, and of course, at Galaxy Podcast. Corner of the galaxy.com, all of our videos, all that stuff. A Thursday show will preview that Miami game and bring you all the news that sort of stacks up against that as well. LA Galaxy playing Miami Sunday. 2021 season is upon us, boys and girls. Glad you could join us. We're happy to be here for our 13th season of coverage. All right, for Kevin the Panda Baxter, I'm Josh Pato Guessman. You've been listening to Corner of the Galaxy from the box on corner of the galaxy.com. Have a great one, everybody. You've been listening to the Corner of the Galaxy podcast on cornerofthegalaxy.com. You can follow the show on Twitter and Instagram at Galaxy Podcast. And be sure to check out and subscribe to iTunes, Stitcher, and Facebook by searching for Corner of the Galaxy. Fans, we thank you for listening, and we ask that you be kind and courteous to your neighbors as you leave the podcast. We thank you for joining us and look forward to seeing you again. Until then, I'm Michael Araujo, and on behalf of the entire Corner of the Galaxy crew, goodbye, everybody.